Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Amanda, and I'm coming to you live from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And I'm excited that you decided to join us today because for the next half hour, what we're going to be doing is taking a little tour and learning more about what goes on here at the aquarium and taking care of 12,000 animals. So 12,000 animals, that's an awfully lot. Uh, I don't know if you've ever taken care of a pet, if you have pets at home. Uh, can you imagine having 12,000 of them, or I should say over 12,000 of them? Uh, well, we're going to learn what our staff here does. But I also am going to invite you to share your thoughts and ideas and any questions you have during our program to the number that you see on your screen now. So right here where it says 562-286-1818. 38. That is a number you can use to text any questions, observations, comments that you would like to share to participate in the program today. But children, please make sure you have your parents' permission to do so um, before joining us. So I'd like you to think about what it would be like. Let's explore this idea together of what it would be like to care for all of these different animals. Because we have more we, well, we have a lot of animals, but they're not all fish. It's not just fish that the aquarium has. We have mammals. We have birds, we have reptiles, uh, we even have some amphibians. And as you think about what it would be like to take care of all of those different kinds of animals, um, let me also introduce a word to you. Uh, the word is husbandry. Husbandry is a word that refers to animal health care. So all of our staff in all of our departments or in all of our husbandry department that is involved in caring for these animals is involved in the husbandry department. So husbandry department is the animal health care department, and that can consist of a lot of different kinds of people. We could have volunteers uh, that are working to make sure that the tanks are clean. Um, that could involve um, the people who work with the mammals. Now, depending on what type of animal it is that they work with, they have different names. A mammologist is a person who works with the mammals. So they would care for our otters, our seals, and sea lions. Uh, we also have aviculturists, and aviculturists take care of our birds, like the lorikeets, and our shorebirds, and our penguins, of course. Uh, we also have aquarists. So you might imagine that an aquarist would take care of these things that are swimming around in the water here, the fish, uh, but also our invertebrates, which are the animals without any backbones, like the sea stars and the um, anemones and sea jellies. All of those would be taken care of by Aquarius as well. Um, and then we also have another branch of our husbandry department called our vet team. So our vet team would consist of our veterinarian as well as our veterinary technicians. And we also already have a question coming in. So thank you, Benjamin, um, who wants to know, do you have a care center? And absolutely, with that many animals, we need to have a place where we could bring them to get all the expert care uh, that they might need. And so we have a place here at the aquarium called the Molina Animal Care Center. So it's kind of like going to the doctor for you and I, or going to the vet for your pet. Uh, so we provide a place where we can keep some very special tools and some very special equipment and make it available to give the best possible care that we can to our animals. But keeping in mind that the daily care and maintenance of all of these animals and being watched by all of those different people who care for them, the aquarists, the mammologists, aviculturists, uh, they all are doing what we call preventative care. So they are making sure that every day the animals are getting all the proper food that they need, that the conditions that they're living in are right, for that particular animal. So that could be anything from the water temperature to the types of other animals that are in the exhibit with them. Those are all under the control of the husbandry staff that work with those animals and care for them on a daily basis. They also are the ones who are watching these animals each and every day. One of the first things that our staff do here at the aquarium is to look at the animals in their exhibits. So every exhibit here has a person in charge of it to make sure that those animals are getting everything they need and making sure that their exhibit is great and healthy as well as the animals inside of it. And they know what's normal for those animals. So watching them and looking at their behavior is key. So we can even take a peek into our Blue Cavern exhibit right now and look at the types of animals that you can see in here. Obviously, they're not all the same. We have some that live in different areas of the exhibit. And also everything you're seeing here is something that was a lot of time and effort and thought was put into 
placing it in these different environments to create the habitat for these animals. So we've got the kelp that's um, right here because we're um, making a kelp forest habitat for the animals that would normally live in it. And you will see fish that are kind of hanging out right in that kelp. You might see some that are hanging out on the bottom here. You might see them going under the rocks. So even the rocks in the exhibit are important for them. Uh, but we have people who are watching them. Oh, do you see the shark? So we've got sharks in here along with these other fish as well. And everyone has a different type of behavior that's normal for them. So if the husbandry care team sees that a fish that's normally swimming around at the top is suddenly one day sitting at the bottom, well, that might be a clue to them to indicate that something might be wrong with that animal. Because if there is something wrong with an animal, they can't tell us the way that a person could communicate to another person that, hey, I'm not feeling good. Can you take me to the doctor? Um, our, our care team has to look for other things besides just listening to for their language. Uh, so looking at how they're behaving, or maybe it's an animal that normally is sitting down at the bottom and is suddenly swimming around at the top kind of sporadically. That would also be an indication that something might not quite be right with the animal. Or if they're eating more than usual or less than usual, not eating at all, um, those are all good indicators. So what would happen if they decide, well, this is something I can't take care of. Who am I going to turn to? Well, if you have a pet at home, you know, if your pet is sick, where are you going to take them? Take them to the vet. However, our vet here does house calls. So not all of our animals have to be taken to our Molina Animal Care Center. A lot of the work can be done at the exhibit, so it doesn't have to stress the animal out by taking them there. But let's go ahead and take a little step over to our uh, Molina Animal Care Center and see what it looks like there. So as you look around this room, I want you to look for clues to think about what types of procedures might happen here at the care center. What types of equipment do you think that our staff would be using to care for the animals here at the aquarium? Now you will notice that there are some people in here. So we have veterinarians, as I said, and veterinary technicians uh, that are making sure that all the animals are uh, well taken care of, that they're getting the medicines that they need um, if it's necessary to give them medicines. Many of our animals don't need any of those things. Um, and they live quite healthfully day to day. But occasionally something will come up that might require a special trip. Um, and we also do regular um, uh, checkups for our animals, just like you get a regular checkup each year to make sure to see how, how much you've grown and make sure that you're looking as healthy as you should be. Um, and here's a picture of some of the other things that are in that room that maybe you didn't see in that first picture or that first video. What do you think these are for? Well, we mentioned medications, right? So lots of different animals would need lots of different kinds of medicine based on what it is uh, that might be ailing them. Can you think of anything that might be something we would encounter for an animal at the aquarium? Can you think of any reason why an animal would need medicine? Can you think of any other reason that an animal might need to come to the care center besides just me needing medicine? In fact, as you're looking around here, we can see there's lots of things in jars. Some of them seem to have little squirt bottles, so they must, must be liquid medications. Some of them are pills. And then we even have IVs here. So we can give these to an animal if necessary through an injection by giving them a shot, right? So they could have something going right directly into whether it be their arm or a flipper. Um, it all depends on the animal. So we have a lot of the medical things that are necessary uh, to care for the animals that our veterinary technicians and our veterinarian are prepared to offer them. Now, every type of animal is going to need a different type of medication. Um, and again, based on those needs. But take a look at this. You might be wondering, why are you showing me a picture of a table? <laughs> well, this is a very special table in our uh, animal care center room uh, that I don't know if you noticed it before, but it has this crisscross thing and it's got these this hydraulic lift down here, which enables this table to go up and down. Now, why do you think it would be important for the table to go up and down? Well, say we had a large animal. In fact, one of our largest animals here is one of our sea lions. A sea lion, a California sea lion like Parker here could weigh up to 880 pounds. That is a very large animal. And if we needed to transfer that animal onto a tall table, that could be really difficult. So this hydraulic table, the fact that it can lower all the way down to the floor makes it a lot easier for us to be able to lift a very large animal onto it. So here's a picture of Parker. Um, our California sea lion uh, with Shara here. And you can see he's got this really cool 
bump on his head right here. That's how you can tell that it's a male sea lion because they get this ridge on their head called a sagittal crest. Um, and it gives them good surface area for these big jaw muscles to attach to give them a nice strong bite. Uh, so anyhow, that's one of our sea lions. But I also want you to notice, what do you think Shara is doing right here? Do you notice that she has her hand right here? Now, what she's doing here is what we call a target. So the sea lion knows when he sees that fist that that is where his nose is supposed to go and holding his hand right there to the fist. That may, means, okay, I'm going to stay still to do whatever you need to do. And look at what she has in her hands right here. She actually has a little dropper. So believe it or not, this sea lion is sitting still for eye drops. And that is something that happens a lot with seals and sea lions. As they get older, uh, they might need eye drops and we can give them to them right here at the aquarium. If they were out in the ocean, they wouldn't get that. And as their vision starts to go bad, what would happen to an animal in the ocean who's getting old and who can't see very well and who can't defend itself very well from predators if it can't see them? Well, it might get eaten. So our animals here at the aquarium can live very long, healthy lives, much longer than they normally would out in the ocean uh, because they do get this really great care. Uh, but yeah, so that's a neat little picture of a target and getting some eye drops uh, in Parker. All right, there was a question that came in. It says, would you ever need to take a sample of a fish's blood? Ooh, the answer to that is yes, we might. Uh, but that leads us to another question of how. How do you take a blood sample from a fish? Do you think that would be very easy? Do you think you could get a fish to sit still long enough to poke them with something and then get it out? Well, that could be difficult. What we do is we take advantage of a special type of anesthesia or medicine that will make the fish fall asleep that's in a powder form. And then we can sprinkle the powder into the water and it causes the fish to go to sleep. So yes, that is an upside down fish, but it's not dead. That's just the fish as it's going to sleep. So they know that the fish is falling asleep when they see it starting to swim on its side like that. So what's happening is because remember, fish use their gills to help them breathe. And so as the water is going into their gills, they're getting the oxygen out of the water. However, if they're sleeping, or if we put um, the powder into the medication into the water, it will then dissolve so that as they're breathing that water, it's getting the medicine into their body as well, causing them to go to sleep. Now, if we were to have a surgery done and we were going to go to sleep because we breathe air with our lungs, they would give us something like a face mask um, or some sort of mask that would fit over our nose and our mouth so that as we're breathing, we're breathing gas. So our anesthesia is in a gas form that would go into our lungs to keep us asleep. But not our animals, not all of our animals here. Some of our animals at um, the aquarium get their medicine in water, and some of them might be coming to the surgical suite right here. So remember, not all of them are fish, like our seals and sea lions, they would breathe air. And so if they needed to be put to sleep, we would have to create a mask for them. Now our masks can be in all sorts of sizes. So an animal like a sea lion, like Parker you saw, would have to have a very big mask to fit over his nose and mouth. But think about a lorikeet, a little tiny bird that's only this big. And so we would have to have a very small mask to fit over the beak of that lorikeet. But this is where we could do a surgery um, in our surgical suite. So this room is sterilized and we make sure that um, just like if you go into a surgery at a hospital, they take extra precautions to make sure that there aren't any things in there uh, that could cause any infection or any problem for you as you're opening up um, or being opened up or as we are opening up the animals here. And so we have again a nice um, table here for them to be on for the surgical procedure to happen. We also have this ventilator right here to make sure um, that they are being able to breathe and getting the anesthesia that they need and things are pumping for them. So um, even as they're not thinking about it, um, they're getting the medicine and the oxygen that they need to breathe. We also have um, monitors in here. We have other equipment. These two items right here are uh, more for our birds because this one right here is an egg incubator. Now if you think about eggs and birds, uh, we do actually have birds at the aquarium and they're not all lorikeets. Some of the time they are lorikeets as I mentioned, but sometimes we also have other birds like our shorebirds. And one of the examples of our shorebirds is, an, is a bird called an American avocet. They're beautiful birds with really, really long legs. And they have these really long beaks. And we have 
um, had some baby avocets, and this is what they look like when they're little babies. They're really, really cute. I'll try to stay out of the way. Uh, so they have kind of a grayish coloring when they're little, but still you can tell they have those very long legs and long beaks. Uh, these are birds that live um, in wetland areas and um, near the shore, uh, but also in the water. And we had some baby avocets born here, but when the birds um, are born, sometimes depending on the bird and the parent, um, if they're not sitting on their eggs to keep them warm, if we needed to come in and if the bird wasn't taking very good care of their eggs or something, we could actually remove them and put them into that egg incubator that we were showing you earlier. And that would keep them nice and warm if the mama bird isn't sitting on them, keeping those eggs nice and warm. Now, fortunately, all of these birds did really well. They hatched, their parents took good care of them, and they got a little bit bigger. So as they got bigger, they're not quite as fluffy. They start to look a little bit more like mom and dad. So birds will go through these different phases of molts uh, where their feathers will start to look a little bit different and change. And then as they get older and they turn into their adults, certain times of the year, they have this sort of rusty, um, really beautiful uh, brownish red color head. Uh, we might be able to show you a picture of that. Um, but anyhow, when we are looking at those birds and we wanna make sure that they are healthy, what kinds of things do you think that we would look for uh, for a bird like that? Here, here's a beautiful picture of our American avocet with one of the adults. You can see it does have a band on its leg. Uh, that's one of the ways that we can identify the individual birds uh, because it might be hard at first glance to tell the difference between this one and another American avocet. They're um, coloring is going to look very, very similar, but we do have them individually um, identified. And then there is another bird down here. This one is not the same kind of bird. This is called a black neck stilt, uh, but also a shorebird with a very long beak and very long legs. But again, making sure this bird is healthy, those legs are really important for those birds. Uh, it's just standing on one right now, but they live in those waters um, where it helps them to stay, their bodies stay dry as they're searching for food from the water to eat. So here is actually an examination happening at our care center with Dr. Adams, our veterinarian, um, looking at the legs of one of our little avocet chicks. So this is um, one of our aviculturists who's hanging on and holding on to the avocet so it's being nice and still. Uh, whenever we have a procedure is that's going on at the care center, we make sure that we have someone who normally takes care of the bird, so our aviculturist, um, or someone who would normally take care of the fish in the exhibit, like the aquarist. Uh, so that main person is there because they're kind of like the parents. So if you think about if you as a child, if you got sick, your parents take care of you, right? But if there's something that seems like you've gotten really sick and you might need medicine, they would take you to the doctor. So your parent goes with you to the doctor. The doctor has all the training. So our veterinarian and our vet technicians have all the training to know what to look for, uh, for the more advanced uh, medical care that the animal might need. And so uh, they do the examination. And what's really neat is we allow our guests to watch this as it's happening as well, because the care center has these big windows out in front. And so when our care team is in here working with an animal, they'll also have people on the outside of the care center talking to our guests about what's going on. And we even have a camera overhead. So see how we're getting this nice picture for you looking down on what's going on? Uh, we can provide that for our guests to see as well. It gives them the vet's eye view of everything that's happening. So those are things we might be looking for. Um, a physical examination of an animal. Uh, just like you go to the doctor once a year, probably our animals, some of our animals also get yearly checkups as well. And during those checkups, they would use different types of diagnostic tools. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, think of any tool that your doctor uses to check up on you and make sure that you're healthy. What are some of those things that you can think of? Um, as you're thinking about that, I do see that there is another question that came in, it says, how do you make a mask for a fish? Now that would be a really good question if we had to make a mask for one, because fish heads can come in so many different shapes and sizes, right? It'd be really difficult to do. And some of them have mouths that stick out like this, and some have really huge mouths, some are on the underside of their body. But when it comes to um, putting a fish um, under anesthesia to put them to sleep so we can do a surgery, we don't need a mask at all. All we have to do is put water or put powder into the water that they're swimming in and then they breathe it through their gills. So no mask is required since they use gills for breathing. Now this is a procedure on one of our eels. This is a moray eel that had this big fatty growth on its head. So our veterinarian was removing that growth. And did you notice when it was, when you were looking at the eel that it was out of the water? 
Well, how did that eel stay breathing out of the water? Notice, there's the medicine going into the water, but now it's out of the water. Huh. How is that fish able to breathe? How is the eel able to breathe during this procedure? Any ideas? Any clues that you see? Well, another question just came in about how many animals are usually in the care center at a time. Um, and most of the time, um, if you walk by the care center, you might not see any animals in the care center. So fortunately, that's a good sign that all the animals are healthy and out in their exhibits. Um, occasionally, you might see one if we're doing a procedure on one animal. Um, I'd say the animals I've probably seen in there the most can be the lorikeets because those are the ones that will sometimes um, be in there in the egg incubator or in the chick brooder. That was that other uh, thing. It almost looks like a little microwave, those little boxes uh, that were in the surgical suite. And we can keep them and let them be in there until they get a little bit older and are able to fly. Um, in fact, that's one of the other things that we use our care center for is to give them flying lessons. Yes, we actually have to train our birds how to fly because these beautiful birds here, while they are very happy out in Lorikeet Forest and they do produce a lot of babies for us, um, one thing that we have to do if they're out in Lorikeet Forest is once they get to the stage where the chick hatches and it's ready to leave its nest, well, we want to make sure that that baby is nice and safe and that it isn't picked on by any of the other birds in Lorikeet Forest. So at that stage, we'll actually remove them and put them in the chick brooder to keep them nice and, and warm um, until we know that they're big enough and safe enough to go out back into Lorikeet Forest again. But during that time is the time that they learn to fly. And so our aviculturists will go into the care center, into the room with them, and they'll put their bird on their arm and they'll just kind of raise their arm up and down like that and get them used to using their wings, helping them out with balance. And then eventually they'll get to the point where the birds are flying around in the room. So that's some flight training that our birds get to go, get to go through and we get to watch that here at the aquarium as well, as well as our guests do. Uh, so thank you for that question. There's usually not too many animals in the care center at one time. Um, occasionally though, we might have a day that we said, okay, today's the day we're going to give um, vaccinations to all of our birds. And so one at a time, there might be one coming down or they might bring two birds down at a time. I also want you to think about how we're going to transfer these animals. So here's a little baby penguin chick, it's so cute. So we do have baby penguins uh, that have been born here at the aquarium as well. Usually it's the parents uh, who start taking care of them um, on their own and then they get to a stage where they would want to leave the nest and until they're big enough to be with the other penguins in the exhibit, uh, our staff will kind of take care of them behind the scenes um, until they can be reintroduced to the rest of the colony a little bit at a time. Uh, just to keep them all safe and healthy. But um, we were, what was I going to say? <laughs> oh, the anesthesia. So if you're thinking about how you, um, a question again about the, the fish, the anesthesia, how were they able to um, keep breathing? Did you happen to notice when you were looking at that video? Did you happen to see the little tube that was going into the mouth of the eel? So that's how we can do surgery on a fish. Once the fish is asleep, we can remove them from the water. And notice that it has a nice padded case right here to keep it upright, but then there's that tube. And there's a tube right down here that you can see. The tube has running water in it, that medicated water, so it's keeping the fish asleep, that goes into its mouth and over the gills. All we have to do is make sure that we see the water coming out of the gills on the side of the eel's head and that we know that that way they're able to get the medicine that they need to stay asleep and to not be in pain. And they're also getting uh, the oxygen that they need to breathe. So as long as that water is flowing over them, we can keep them out of the water as long as we're keeping their skin or their scales nice and moist uh, for a good length of time. We uh, recently did a surgery that was over four hours long on one of our eels. Uh, so we can keep the animal out of the water for a long time. It may surprise you. Uh, but now that's a fish. That's an example of a fish. And um, another type of fish though that sometimes people wonder how you take care of are sharks. And do you think we do procedures on sharks? Well, yes we do. Well, how do you do it? It starts with getting the shark and it requires Quite a few people you'll notice in this video. This is a black tip reef shark that we were doing an ultrasound on. 
Now, in ultrasound, you might be familiar with uh, that idea. When a woman is pregnant and you want to see the baby inside, uh, you can use an ultrasound, which uses sound waves. And that's the device that he's using right here. Uh, the shark is upside down right now, so you're looking at the belly of the black tip reef shark. And this is the image that's coming through as those sound waves are bouncing off uh, what's inside they're getting an image of the inside of that shark. So that's another what we would call diagnostic tool to give us a view and indication into the animal's health and what's really going on inside of them. Um, so it does allow us to see babies as babies are growing. Uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we have had a number of babies born here at the aquarium, and it's not just birds. Um, it could be sharks. Uh, it could be seals. Uh, it could be sea lions, all sorts of things. So um, we are really happy that we have not only the equipment we could use to do it, but that it's also portable. So you notice our staff actually went out to the exhibit where the shark was. We didn't actually have to bring the shark to the care center. We just needed a lot of people to help get that shark together and keep it in one spot so our vet uh, could do the ultrasound and then we could get those results. The great thing about the aquarium healthcare is that the animals get their results right away and they don't have to wait for referrals to go through or wait for a big long paperwork to finish. Uh, they can get the care that they need as soon as um, it's deemed that, oh, they need some care, or they need some extra help. Now, have you thought about any, any other procedures that might happen at the aquarium? Um, what about things that have happened to you? Have you ever had stitches before? Well, that's something that one of our animals might need too. And we can do stitches on even sharks. But here's an example of a fish called a stonefish. He's got these crazy little warty bumps all over him. And the mouth is open right here and there's the water that's going in to make sure he's able to breathe. But this is a procedure that Dr. Adams is doing on one of our uh, stonefish to make sure that it's all stitched up together. I don't know exactly what um, happened that needed that caused the need for stitches but if there's any sort of cut or gash that needs to be stitched together they can use um, regular stitches uh, to stitch them up so kind of neat huh all right so we've looked at some some procedures that have happened um, at the care center as far as ultrasounds um, doing stitches um, but again, think about procedures that you've had done when you've gone to the doctor, even on those well checkups. Maybe there's nothing, maybe you're not feeling sick, but we just want to know how much have you grown? Um, how is your health? What are some of the things they look for when you go to the doctor? Well, another diagnostic tool we use is a stethoscope. So we want to listen to the animal's heart. And here's one of our cute procedures being done on our penguins, our Magellanic penguins. Uh, so using the stethoscope to listen to the heart rate of the penguin, make sure it's beating the right way it should be. Uh, they can listen to the lungs, make sure that they're all sounding the way uh, they should be sounding. Uh, but it's kind of fun when these procedures are happening because, again, you can see these big wide open windows here. Any of our guests can come by and watch this as our Magellanic penguin is getting uh, its little checkup. So what are some other things that could be happening when you go to the doctor? Or is there any other doctor that you go to besides your regular doctor? Do you ever have to have work done on your teeth? Well, we have dental work that is sometimes done on our animals as well. So here's a picture of one of our sea otters getting their teeth cleaned. So during their regular physical exams, they have their routine exam. Uh, we actually put them to sleep for those exams to make it easier for us to find out all the things that we need to find out about uh, them without the animal getting too worried or stressed out or scared. Um, and so here's one of our seals. So the sea lion is also getting some dental work done, getting their teeth cleaned. Uh, so as they're asleep, as they're asleep, we can look at, um, we can listen to their heart. We can look all over their body for anything that might um, tell us that something might be wrong. Looking at how are their paws, how how's their tail. They can get all the blood samples that they need without being worried about being poked, um, but then they can also look at their teeth. Now this is actually a procedure also on our seal, but they're looking at the eye of the seal instead. Notice there's really interesting um, equipment uh, that they're using to get a close-up view with this really bright light, um, a close-up view of the eye of the animal. They're actually using these um, like long swabs um, to help hold the seal's eye open so it's a little bit gentler than just using um, 
fingers. It's got a smaller tip um, and is able to keep that eye open so that they can get a really good look at our seal's eye. So those are some things uh, that we do for our animals that maybe you had done um, as the doctors looked at your eyes or listened to your lungs or listened to your heart beating. Uh, we can do that for our, an our animals here at the aquarium as well. But I will point out that we looked at the dentist working on a sea otter and a seal but you will not see the dentist doing any teeth cleaning for our sea lions. Sea lions have very special teeth that actually when they're in their best shape, they're actually black, believe it or not. They have bacteria, a healthy bacteria that is um, on their teeth and we don't want to brush off their teeth and cause that to come off because that's really important. So look, there's a great um, visual here of Parker with his mouth open and you can see they do not have white teeth. They have these black teeth, and that's a good healthy sign for a sea lion. Very different from those bright white seal teeth that you saw. So, and that's a nice little open mouth sign that you see her giving um, so that the animal knows, hey, I've been trained that if they do this, I'm supposed to open my mouth. And when I do it, they give me a reward and I get fish to eat afterwards. Uh, and so that is one of the things that we do when we train the animals. One of the important reasons why we train them is to help us take better care of them and give them really good health care. We can look at their teeth. Otherwise, it'd be really hard to go up to a big 800 pound animal and try to get them to open their mouth if you didn't train them to voluntarily do it for you. Uh, so really great work that our um, animal care team does, our husbandry team with these animals. Well, we are out of time, but I hope you enjoyed uh, joining me today and learning a little bit more about how we care for our animals here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. And hopefully one day when our doors are open, you'll be able to come here, see it with your own eyes and visit the care center for yourself and take a look at, maybe you'll be here when a procedure is being done, whether, whether it be a physical examination or maybe um, an animal getting stitches um, or just getting a blood, blood draw to make sure that they're all healthy. Uh, but we love being able to share the work that we're doing here to care for our animals. And uh, we love you to be a part of it as well. So thank you everyone for joining us today. We have one more program today for our Aquarium Online Academy. And we'll be here uh, the rest of the week as well. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.